Good evening and uh, welcome to the what I think is the 17th in our uh, uh, Hand in Hand with Ukraine webinar series. Um, I'm delighted uh, to welcome uh, Inge Bergmans from uh, Zurich uh, for the first time to the series. Dominic Power has been at least once and maybe twice before. Uh, Kate Brown, uh, Dom's from uh, Birmingham, uh, and uh, Kate is uh, Kate Brown's from uh, Derby, uh, and has uh, also been a a recent speaker. Uh, Pierre Luigi and I and Andre should need no introduction. Um, so we're talking about the uh, management of nerve injury. Uh, uh, with reference to to conflict injuries this evening, uh, and it's a uh, th there won't be a lecture, but there's a series of case presentations. Andre, do you want to tell us a bit more about the cases, uh, and perhaps do a bit in Ukrainian? That's uh, a little lecture and a few cases. So uh, I think we, I hope for the fruitful discussion. А, а, доброго вечора, шановні колеги. А, сьогодні ми обговоримо, а, сьогодні, раді вітати вас на 17-му вебінарі нашому, який проводиться сумісно з Федерацією Європейських Асоціацій Хірургів Кісті та а, Британським Товариством Хірургії Кісті. А, сьогодні ми обговоримо наш український алгоритм лікування а, пацієнтів з вогнепальними пораненнями периферичних нервів. Я сподіваюся, що вам буде цікаво і, будь ласка, закликаю вас, задавайте ваші запитання, будьте активними. Uh, hi, friends and colleagues. Uh, I hope it will be interesting for all of you. So I will share my screen and I try... Can you see my slides? Yeah. Yes, we can. Andre, as usual, please put your questions either in the chat or the Q&A and feel free to use English or Ukrainian, uh, whichever suits you best. So, uh, good day, dear colleagues. Uh, the, I want to discuss with you our uh, treatment algorithm for the peripheral uh, nerve war injuries, and I hope for the fruitful discussion after uh, this presentation. So the specifics of warfare with the use of modern uh, military equipment determines the severity of injuries, uh, we, uh, which is uh, mostly polystructural injury, uh, which in turn burdens then complicates the provision of medical aid in terms of restoring anatomical structures and functional capabilities. And of course, this is to justify the need to improve uh, the existing clinical and organizational treatment aspects of the wounded, particularly those with uh, gunshot injuries of the peripheral nerves. Uh, so we uh, make some of our uh, statistics uh, and find out that uh, from 420 patients with gunshot wound uh, injuries of the extremities who were treated in our department, the Department of Microsurgery and Reconstructive Surgery of the Upper Extremity of uh, Institute of Traumatology and Orthopedics of National Academy of Medical Sciences of Ukraine, which is based in Kyiv. Uh, we find that uh, 140 patients, it's about 33% of uh, all these patients were diagnosed with peripheral nerve injuries. And from these 33%, about 18% of these patients were diagnosed with uh, upper extremity peripheral nerve injury. Uh, I'm sorry I cannot share all our uh, findings from our statistics with you because the war is still going on. And uh, but I hope you understand this, and I hope that uh, it will end soon very quickly, and uh, we can meet face-to-face -face and discuss a lot of uh, our 
data. So uh, the features of uh, this kind of injuries, uh, first of all, uh, the frequency of uh, limp injuries. Yeah, the first place, four to three percent. That's uh, upper left uh, extremity, then upper right, uh, lower left, and lower right extremity. And if you look at the the picture of these uh, special forces of Ukraine uh, soldier, you can uh, see uh, that the pattern of uh, this injury is mostly dictated by how these soldiers uh, carry their gun. Uh, during uh, the conflict, uh, the uh, upper left extremity is at the front of him. So uh, uh, left hand has uh, uh, take most of the damage. Then the right hand and uh, the legs are uh, mostly secured. Uh, the distribution of wounds uh, according to the nature of the wound in projectile, most of them, 65% of them was from shrapnel and blast injuries and 35% uh, of them was made by bullets. Um, interestingly, the, the uh, shrapnel injury significantly uh, deals significantly more injury to the surrounding tissues. Uh, in 21.4%, uh, it combines with main vessel injuries. Uh, almost 71% of all sharp injuries combined with gunshot fractures of the bones. Uh, about half of them uh, combines with uh, big muscle defects that require reconstruction, and 36% um, uh, of them combined with massive skin defects, and as you can see in this picture, um, about 15% of all gunshot nerve injuries were without an anatomical nerve defect. And what is uh, the most interesting data that we find that the average size of the primary nerve defect was not sig significantly uh, different from the nature of wounded projectile and was about five to six centimeters. Um, we think that uh, shrapnel injury and blast injury must deal more damage to the tissues. And of course it can uh, deal more uh, nerve defects, but uh, statistics is statistics and we don't find any significant difference between uh, shrapnel injury or uh, bullet injury. Uh, so the features of uh, uh, wound uh, of gunshot wounds uh, of gunshot peripheral nerve injuries uh, frequently is indirect injury. About half of them is indirect injury of the peripheral nerves by the shock waves, and you can see in this picture here when we uh, find that the median nerve that is still in continuity but don't work due to the uh, concussion injury. Uh, in case of nerve defect, th this is the formation of a primary nerve defects often uh, determined, like uh, there, uh, the primary defect of the ulnar nerve at the level of the forearm. Uh, damage and further fibrosis of the uh, perineural tissues, uh, mesonurium, cause the compression of the nerve and the injury to the nerve. Uh, of course, the presence of various type of uh, peripheral nerve uh, damage in one nerve, such as in this picture, that's the sniper uh, that was injured during the uh, sniper duel with uh, the enemy. He was lucky. Uh, he have a few uh, fascicles that are still in continuity, and that one was the motor fascicles. And a few of them was uh, completely destroyed, and this one was sensory fascicle. So he preserved all of his uh, function, but uh, with no uh, sensitivity. And of course, if we speak about um, a shrapnel injury, we must speak about multi-level uh, nerve injury. So uh, as you can see from this video here, when the bullet comes through the um, ballistic gel, uh, you can see the formation of the primary uh, cavity, then the secondary cavity and the cavitational effect. 
And this cavitational effect can uh, injure indirectly the nerve by traction and, is, and uh, but and cause the traction injury of uh, the nerve trunk and then uh, the ischemia and of course the injury of paraneural tissues uh, around the nerve. Um, many uh, of the patients which uh, have the nerve, uh, the, have the primary nerve defects, like these patients, uh, this patient with subclavian brachial plexus injury with the nerve defect about five to six centimeters. Uh, damage of uh, uh, paraneural tissues often leads to its fibrotic changes. Uh, like here we can see uh, the fibrosis around the median nerve at the level of uh, uh, the forearm, fibrosis around the uh, ulnar nerve at the level of the forearm. Of course, uh, the skin graft applied to the nerve uh, deals only more uh, injury and scarring around the nerve, so we need to replace this. Uh, and uh, like this at the level of the shoulder, the ulnar nerve that are compressed with uh, sick uh, fibrotic scar. Uh, not rarely, we can see the compression of the nerve uh, with bone callus uh, in late period. Uh, uh, almost uh, always after uh, the um, bone healed in the X fix. Uh, so uh, with the help of Shiso, we need to, to make the neuralizers of uh, radial nerve and. Uh, extracted from the bone uh, callus, like here. Uh, when we speak uh, about the different types of peripheral nerve damage in one nerve, we must remember the modified uh, Seddon Sunderland uh, classification. Uh, you can see here with all six classes and uh, subclasses of it. Uh, and uh, most of these injuries is the mixed type of injury. Uh, when there are some fascicles are uh, still in continuity and like normal, some of them have neuropraxis, some axonet meses, and uh, part of them are completely destroyed. And we, if we let it be uh, this type of uh, injury, we have only partial or mosaic restoration. Uh, but with predicted and satisfactory functional result, uh, like you. Uh, you can see in this photo here, uh, some colleagues uh, like to uh, excise the whole defect and make grafting. I like to uh, make some neuralysis, try to preserve the fascicles that are still in continuity and make the uh, grafting of only uh, damaged fascicles, but it's what surgeons like to do. And of course, multi-level injury. Uh, like in oh, this uh, soldier that have injury of his uh, median nerve at the level of the shoulder and at the level of the proximal forearm. Uh, this guy uh, that have uh, compression injury of the, mid, of the ulnar nerve at the level of the shoulder and uh, the defect of the ulnar nerve at the level of the forearm. And uh, sometimes uh, shrapnel injury can uh, damage uh, different nerves, like here, uh, ulnar nerve at the uh, cubital channel and the, the branches of the medial nerve. Uh, if we can speak about some types of basic science, uh, we must remember uh, the structure of the peripheral nerve and pay attention to the very important uh, things such as vascular system of the peripheral nerve, or microcirculatory system of the peripheral nerve, paraneural tissues uh, such as me mesonerium, fat pad around the nerve. Uh, of course, uh, complex structure of the neuromuscular junction and uh, the skeletal muscle itself. Because if we have the injury of the skeletal muscle, we have the question about, do we need to restore the nerve? 
Uh, so after the nerve injury, we can have the uh, primary defect of the peripheral nerve, but of course the cavitation effect uh, can damage the paraneural tissues that leads to uh, its ischemia and then formation of the dense scar that can uh, compress the nerve and make even more injury to this nerve. Uh, of course, we have uh, the disruption of the microcirculatory system of the nerve, uh, and uh, it's in the first three weeks after uh, the gunshot injury, we still cannot find uh, where the microcirculatory system can restore and where it, when, where it is completely obliterated. So. Uh, as uh, Rolfi Birch uh, uh, showed in one of his study, uh, they compare uh, two groups of patients. In one group, they uh, make a, a nerve uh, suture as soon as possible, and then the next and the second group, they make a nerve reconstruction after three weeks after uh, the injury in the late period and. Uh, he showed that the results are better uh, when the nerve was restored at the late period of time uh, than at the early period uh, because uh, of this microcirculatory system uh, changes. Uh, sometimes we can suture the nerve, but it ends up with uh, an aroma in continuity or a dense scar in between the nerve ends. Uh, and uh, any axon can, can grow uh, through this. Of course, uh, when we speak about uh, cavitation effect, we must understand the possibility of a narrow muscular junction disruption. And that I think the most difficult question for us as a surgeons, because we cannot uh, make some operation and reconstruct the narrow muscular junction, and we need only to hope uh, that uh, axon will grow to this muscle and try to uh, reinnervate it somehow. And uh, of course, the direct and indirect uh, injury to the target muscles can lead to inability of uh, neuromuscular connection, uh, restoration, and uh, even uh, the loss of uh, target muscle. And uh, we, when we have the loss of target muscle, we should question, do we need to restore the nerve? Uh, so, speaking about timing, as I said before, uh, uh, we find in literature uh, that up to three weeks nerve reconstruction is not recommended because uh, it is impossible to determine the dips of microcirculatory changes in the nerve. And if we don't have the good blood supply at the level of nerve reconstruction, uh, there will be a scar, uh, the glial scar or the fibrotic scar, and uh, the axon cannot grow through this uh, zone of reconstruction, and we don't uh, have any function uh, at the end. So we need to wait. And then uh, the optimal timing for peripheral nerve reconstruction after gunshot injury uh, that's from three weeks to three months uh, period. At this time, uh, we have uh, the microcirculatory system uh, restore what it can, can restore. And uh, we have the true defect of the nerve. And uh, it is too early to uh, for some uh, changes in the distal nerve segment or in the neuromuscular junction or in the uh, target muscles itself. Uh, you will speak about the period from three to six months. Uh, satisfactory uh, effectiveness of muscle function restoration is uh, we can achieve, but we must understand that uh, some changes can occur in the distal uh, nerve seg segment, uh, the shrinkage of uh, uh, Schwann cells at the distal nerve. Uh, Segment uh, segment is uh, uh, going on, and uh, we have some uh, hypertrophy of uh, the target muscles and other things. So, if we have the proximal injury, we need to restore it as soon as possible. Uh, 
but not earlier than three weeks uh, after the injury. Uh, and at the distal injuries, we can uh, think about uh, having a satisfactory result after in, even in a later period, uh, after the three months after the injury. But uh, we must understand that in the hand, we have a little muscle and the little muscles uh, are... Uh, uh, hy hypertrophied faster than uh, the big muscles. Uh, if we speak uh, period about the period from six to nine months, uh, there is lower questionable effectiveness of muscle function restoration because we have uh, changes in the distal nerve segment. We, uh, according to the literature, we have a start of the migration and apoptosis of the terminal Schwann cells, and uh, we have a start of the depletion of the pool of satellite cells of myocytes. Uh, that uh, can worsen uh, the that that worsen uh, the uh, regeneration potential of the of the skeletal muscle. If we speak of a period from nine to twelve months, the restoration of the nerve should be carried out in order to restore only the protective sensitivity uh, of the limb and uh, to restore the function. We should think about. Uh, uh, some types of secondary reconstruction, such as tendon transfers. And uh, if there is more than 12 months after the injury, uh, the nerve recovery is mostly impractical, maybe for some protective sensitivity, but we don't, uh, we, we must speak with the patient about it. And uh, we must understand that uh, our result is frequently uh, unsatisfactory in this period of reconstruction. Uh, so the optimal time of nerve reconstruction after the gunshot injuries is from three weeks to three months. And by this time, it is desirable to reconstruct the defects of the uh, soft tissues and skin. We must understand that we, uh, we need to reconstruct the nerve. We need to have a uh, healthy fat tissue around the nerve and uh, put the split sickness skin graft. It's a bad idea because it only uh, makes more scar uh, around, more scars. So we need to use some types of titer flaps or vascular pedicle flaps or microsurgical flaps. Uh, uh, so full air flaps. Uh, we need to eradicate all infection and we need to achieve the final uh, fixation of the bone fragments because if we don't achieve it, uh, we have a constant injury to our uh, site of repair by traction injury or by mm, fragments of the bone or even we can... Uh, disrupt our uh, sutures and our, or our grafts during the osteosynthesis. So uh, bone fixation first and uh, nerve restoration after that. And so we go to our uh, treatment uh, algorithm. If we have the patient with a gunshot injury and we diagnose uh, the nerve for gunshot injury, we should uh, uh, think next. If we have acute uh, nerve uh, acute injury, uh, we should think is nerve in the wound during the debridement. If nerve is not visualized during the debridement, we need to we don't need to uh, make some uh, additional uh, surgical exposures of this nerve. We don't need to uh, make to try to find this nerve. Uh, the nerve may be okay, so we need to wait and see with active monitoring some some clinical dynamics, ultrasound, in G, MRI in some cases, and we must remember that uh, the uh, recovery period can even double. So we just wait and see if we have positive, positive dynamics, it's great. If we have negative dynamics, we 
must uh, revise the nerve, go for the neuralysis and restoration of the paraneural tissues because mm, the nerve and scar will uh, scar again. So we need to restore uh, the fat pad or uh, some gliding system around the nerve. Uh, in our clinic, we use lipofilling when we uh, take the uh, subcutaneous flat at uh, some bone marrow aspirate concentrate and uh, put it around the nerve. Uh, you can also use uh, some synthetic like uh, Neurolab, but we don't have it in Ukraine or it just uh, use nerve uh, a transposition like we do uh, for the ulnar nerve at, at the cubital channel. So uh, if we uh, find the nerve uh, during the, our uh, initial debridement and the nerve in the wound, we need to understand is it intact. If the nerve is in continuity, then we need to close the nerve with some healthy tissues. Um, it is better to close the nerve with uh, local flap, maybe uh, some fat flap, muscle, uh, I mean, with the tissues that have the great blood supply, uh, but uh, never close the nerve with uh, tendons or fascia because uh, they don't have the blood supply and it will lead to uh, scar formation that can damage the nerve even more. So we uh, close the nerve with healthy tissues from, from around the nerve and uh, we wait and see for the dynamics. If we find the nerve in wound and the nerve is injured, um, then we need to mark the epineurium. It is uh, important to understand that uh, we need to mark uh, the epineurium itself, not the nerve with uh, some bright, uh, non-observable one or two sutures. Uh, sometimes we can even uh, try to a little approximate uh, the, uh, the nerve ends, uh, so our nerve defect will no, not grow with time. And in case when we speak about proximal injuries or we understand that uh, the reconstruction of this wound will uh, take a, uh, a, long of, a, lo a long period of time or we need to evacuate this patient to the next facility that cannot uh, make uh, you know, nerve surgery, uh, I think in this uh, uh, period we must think about primary uh, neurotization. This time, if we speak about chronic injury, the wounds are healed. Uh, we make the active monitoring. We see uh, we monitor the clinical dynamics. Uh, perform the ultrasound studies, CMG in some kind of cases MRI. Once again, I. Uh, I said that uh, after the gunshot injuries, the recovery period can even double. So if we have, if our nerve is in continuity, we have the positive dynamics, then we just wait and see. If we have some negative dynamics or we uh, have, uh, or we find nerve injury uh, by sonography, we should, revise the wound. If the nerve is intact, then perform the neurolysis and restore the paraneural tissues so the nerve can glide. Uh, and if we have the injured nerve, our next tactic, it uh, depends on the nerve defect. If there is the possibility of a tension-free nerve suture, which is rare, we should perform it and, uh, of course, restore the mesonerium around the nerve. Uh, um, me personally, I don't think that uh, nerve suture with the flexion in the mm, surrounding joints is a great idea because we need to extend these joints uh, with time. And uh, when we try to extend with this joint, we make the uh, tractional injury to our uh, nerve restoration and we can end, end up with uh, some scar formation. 
in at the uh, zone of our uh, nerve restoration. So I think that that's not a great idea. Uh, if we have a nerve defect uh, less than five centimeters, then we uh, perform nerve grafting and the restoration of uh, surrounding tissues around the nerve, fat pad around the nerve. If we have the big nerve defects uh, from five to 10 centimeters, then we uh, perform the nerve grafting to restore the sensitivity and uh, uh, try to perform the neurotization to restore uh, the motor function. Uh, maybe so in some cases, uh, we uh, perform the neurotization by a uh, supercharged technique. And of course, the restoration of the uh, paraneural tissues. And in case when we have uh, the great uh, defects, uh, more than 10 centimeters, we need to perform the primary uh, distal neurotization or even uh, secondary reconstruction such as tendon transfers. If recovery uh, is uh, partial or absent after our nerve reconstruction, then of course we must return to the secondary reconstruction to restore the uh, function deficit. So a few clinical cases. The first case uh, is acute injury of the median nerve. Nerve is uh, in the wound during the debridement, but the nerve is intact. Uh, this is the patient A, uh, young male, 31 year old, the clinical presentation, X-ray and uh, CT. During the primary debridement, we find the median nerve. We close it uh, with the local uh, healthy tissues. And then after uh, the debridement, we, uh, and when the wound is stable, we close the wound with, uh, the waller wound with an abdominal flap and the dorsal wound with a full sickness skin graft, and then perform the uh, fixation of the steroid pr processes of the radial bone with a plate with uh, using of the uh, bone graft from the crest. Uh, for now, it's about two and a half months after the last operation. We start to uh, uh, try and to restore some mobility in his wrist uh, joint and to prepare him for uh, extensor tendon reconstruction. The next case uh, is uh, uh, Marine. Uh, he have acute injury uh, of his uh, ulnar nerve uh, around the uh, elbow joint. Uh, we find uh, during the debridement we find the uh, uh, nerve ends. Uh, you can see here I take the nerve ends in my in forceps. Uh, we apply some uh, suture that. Later we can find it easily and uh, we don't have the more nerve defect. Uh, but we understand that uh, we cannot reconstruct this wound in earlier time and we, uh, and uh, the patient may be evacuated in the hospital when they uh, don't have the ner uh, nerve surgery team. So we performed uh, uh, early uh, AIN neurotization to the uh, motor fascicle of the ulnar nerve, uh, distal neurotization. And this uh, photo he sent me a few days ago, uh, he begs uh, back to his duty, right uh, now he's in uh, Kherson region, uh, fighting against uh, our enemies and for our freedom. Uh, and as I assume the neurotization goes well because he can uh, return to his duty. Uh, so the next case is a chronic injury. Uh, during sonography, we find the uh, nerve uh, defect. Uh, we go to the revision of the wound. We find the nerve defect that less than five centimeters. Uh, it's four centimeters. So we make the grafting and then perform the lipofilling by using the 
a subcutaneous uh, mixture of subcutaneous flap and BMAC. Uh, the next case is a young boy that uh, was injured uh, because the missile hits his house in Irpin near the Kiev. Uh, so uh, during the sonography, we we'll find that the, his only nerve and the forearm have uh, something about eight centimeters defect. We go for the reconstruction and after neuroma and uh, glioma resection, we have an even more defect of the of the ulnar nerve. So we make grafting and uh, neurotization of the motor fascicle of ulnar nerve by. AIN and enterosis nerve to uh, pronator quadratus. And uh, of course, we use uh, some lipofilm to restore the paraneural tissues around the, uh, around our zone of uh, nerve reconstruction. And we add some uh, BMAC to the uh, denervated muscles of his hand because uh, our uh, uh, experiment. Uh, one of our experiments uh, showed that uh, uh, there is the potential of uh, uh, mesenchymal cells of uh, red bone marrow to uh, differentiate into the satellite cells of myocytes and uh, to preserve the a regeneration uh, possibility of the muscles uh, during the long period of time. Uh, so we make uh, this. And uh, the last uh, clinical case is the young man with uh, injury of the peroneal portion of uh, the sciatic uh, nerve. Uh, you can see the clinical presentation here. That's the blast injury. Uh, during the revision, we find the pieces of shrapnel in his nerves. So we understand that the reconstruction of the nerve, uh, it's not a great idea. So we make the primary tendon transfer of um, the uh, posterior tibialis uh, muscle to, uh, to the extensor, uh, uh, to the finger extensor. Tendons. And of course, if we speak about uh, primary muscle loss, uh, we must understand that uh, there is no need to restore the nerve if we don't have the uh, effector organ. Uh, so we need to think about uh, secondary re reconstruction uh, as the first stage of uh, reconstruction, such as tendon transfers, uh, maybe some uh, arthrodesis, and then tendon transfers. But uh, the nerve reconstruction in such cases uh, will not give us uh, any result. So, in conclusion, in case of peripheral nerve uh, gunshot injuries, a violation of blood supply develops not only in the nerve, which leads to the development of interneural fibrosis, but also to the perineural tissues, which leads to the fibro fibrous degeneration of the fat pad around the nerves and creation of some additional fixation points, uh, secondary compression of the nerve and nerve ischemia. Uh, of course, we need to remember that when treating patients with gunshot wounds, it is worse paying attention to the possibility of multi-level and mixed variants of uh, peripheral nerve injury and the possibility of neuromuscular dis uh, junction disruptions which gives us a mismatch of the muscle recovery pattern. Uh, the optimal time for nerve reconstruction is considered to be from three weeks to three months uh, from the moment of injury. And in terms of uh, nerve regeneration, uh, after the gunshot injuries, if the nerve is in continuity, uh, the terms of regeneration can significantly extend it and sometimes even doubled. And uh, that's all. Thank you for attention and I hope for the fruitful discussion.
Thanks. Well done, Andre. Um, we, we have a question from Muntashawa from Palestine, for the panel. Uh, how can you tell the level of damage to the nerve seg segment in that sometimes it's direct and sometimes it's related to uh, the, sh the shock wave? So I'm assuming if you're recommending repair at three weeks, you reckon you can make a reasonable assessment of the level of, uh, of damage between three weeks and three months? Yeah. Uh, if we uh, have the acute injury, uh, during the deployment, we must, uh, uh, we must make the, uh, during the first deployment, uh, we must uh, think about nerve in the wound and to, if we don't find it, it's okay. We don't need to try to find the nerve in the wound. Uh, so we make just our debridement and we wait and see. And after the uh, one month after the injury, when the wounds are closed, we can uh, perform some sonography or MRI and try to uh, find and find this nerve and. Uh, try to understand uh, its condition. If we have some, for example, neuroma in continuity or formation of the scar, dense scar around this nerve, uh, we will see it in uh, during sonography. Uh, so uh, in this case, we can think about uh, wound revision, go to find this nerve and uh, perform some restoration of this nerve. And if uh, we don't, uh, if during sonography, we don't find uh, any organic problems with this nerve, we just wait and see. Uh, a lot of them, as I said, about 15% of uh, uh, gunshot nerve injuries, uh, the nerve is still in continuity and we just uh, wait because uh, the, terms of recovery can even double. So just uh, active monitoring about clinical dynamics. And so if, if it's in continuity, um, you'd wait how long, three or four months? Uh, I will wait for about three months uh, and uh, uh, seeking for some uh, clinical dynamics, not even not an EMG or uh, something like that. Uh, I, I look for clinics. If we have uh, wet hand, uh, if uh, there is no uh, uh, if, if the hand, for example, the hand is wet, uh, we don't have uh, a lot of uh, uh, we don't have uh, a big hypertrophy of the muscles. Uh, 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 we have some uh, findings that uh, vegetative nervous system is okay. Uh, so I will wait even more. And uh, if the hand is uh, uh, atrophied with some... Uh, Tropical changes, uh, some uh, uh, even some uh, injuries uh, from heat or other things. I will go for nerve explore, exploration at the time of three four months. Kate, what do you think? So yes, um, thank you very much for that, Andre. And it's really interesting because. These, these numbers tally very much with what we previously published, that we've got approximately 45 to 50% of patients with nerve injuries will have a pure neuropraxia, and some of these will have a prolonged conduction block. But the, 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 the key thing that you were talking about, and which I completely agree with, is that um, by the time you've got out of the initial heat of the, the initial injury, when they've had their life and limb saving surgery, and hopefully by the point at which they can be properly clinically examined, 
you can examine obviously for um, any clear motor or sensory losses, um, but you also you can look for the absence of things like your muscle wasting, the absence of uh, sympathetic changes, which will indicate an underlying neurological problem. You can uh, examine them with ultrasonography and you can also do um, neurophysiology. And then in the absence of any fibrillations or sharp rays, if you've got um, no evidence both electrically and on ultrasound and clinically, then at that point you, you can just sit and wait. But if you've got any of the problems that Andre was talking about, then at that point you do need to go and go in and explore. Um, but this prolonged conduction block has been well described across the literature in military wounds. And, uh, and we've had patients who've had recovery of sensation up to 24 months after that initial injury. So, so it does make it a bit more difficult. Um, Thank you. Inga, any thoughts? Uh, Inga, please uh, unmute, unmute yourself. That's better, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for the question. Well, I think, you know, it's interesting to see that the, the critical question in uh, these type of injuries remains the same and whether, whether or not they happen in a war zone or, you know, in um, our daily routine um, during peace times, because I think we're always trying to identify, you know, this uh, group uh, within the axonot mesis injuries um, that will have an unfavorable outcome, right? Because as you were pointing out, Kate, neuroplexia would just wait, right? They will recover. And then if the nerve is obviously cut, um, we, we do know how to approach that, but, um, I think the difficulty will always be to identify uh, those um, uh, patients who have either a mixed injury or, uh, and I think this is mostly the case, or the excellent mesis um, uh, that will have an unfavorable outcome. So um, I think in our hands, what is always helpful is the ultrasound. It gives you an idea of what's happening inside and plus the MR neurography uh, in these type of patients where there might be, uh, you know, still pieces of shrapnel and that. They might not really show you a lot. And if you talk to your radiologist, and I don't know if you feel different about that, but oftentimes, uh, if they're being honest, they, are, they, they will have a hard time, especially with the smaller nerves and actually telling you something that might help. Um, I have um, a, a low threshold uh, to um, um, explore the nerve um, at around um, three months time, especially if at this time, um, we do not see any uh, significant um, motor unit potentials in the um, electrodiagnostic studies. And then what I think is always helpful, um, if, um, if you're able to do that, if you have um, um, a skilled neurologist to help you do that, to actually do an intraoperative um, electroneurography um, and an intraoperative electromyography, um, because then you can actually you know, go inside the nerve, separate um, your fascicles and actually see which ones work and which ones might not. Uh, and this will help you uh, to you know, save uh, what's still viable uh, fascicle wise uh, and uh, graft or reconstruct uh, what is not. If there's a nerve defect, how do, you, how do you tell how far back to cut? Do you just keep cutting back until you get a nice face or what's the um, well, no, go ahead. Yeah, please. Well, I think um, this is what we uh, what we typically do, right? We look for soft, uh, subtle nerves, and, and we do this what is often referred to as red loafing. You know, we slowly cut back until we see those viable fascicles, um, and until uh, we might even see, you know, a vasa nevorum. Um, uh, so some bleeding from the nerve ends, um, and, and this is typically how I would do it. I would actually look for a uh, healthy fascicles. How about you? Dom, are you happy with that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, Andrew, um, I want to say congratulations on a lovely talk. And also, uh, I don't know how you managed to collect data as well and outcomes on your patients in such difficult circumstances. It's incredible to see. Um, I agree pretty much with everything that's been said. I think there are some, there are some absolute black and white, and then there's a gray area. The black and white really is if you've got a transected nerve, it needs reconstructing. Um, 
and the decision making about that and the debridement we can touch on now. Um, I tend to go macroscopically in what I can see with loop magnification and then look at the end of the nerve with the microscope. Um, I'm looking for the change in consistency, not only to palpation, but also uh, the feel when you cut through the nerve about how much fibrous tissue there is, particularly if it's been a delayed expiration. Um, and of course, the fluid within the endoneural tubes is under pressure. There's a hydrostatic pressure column. So you're looking for that bulging of the fascicle groups, which is a sign that you're into healthy nerve tissue, and then look at the vascularity. So all of those things. Um, but sometimes in these blast injuries, we see where there's also a rupture. The zone of injury is really extensive. And it was Professor Rolf Birch who said to me, I, I used to think that if there was no fixed blood staining on the end of the nerve, then I was in healthy tissue. But he said, sometimes you can't come out of the zone of injury and you have to compromise. And that's where it's more art than science. Um, I think we may get to the stage where we have the ability to use interruptive staining and so on. But um, I think in these longitudinal injuries with a rupture, you go back balancing the risk of extending the length of injury to be something that won't support regeneration to having a, a reasonable cut face. Um, and ideally we want that perfect cut face with no blood staining and, and, and pouting. But we're talking now about the grey areas really in the decision making and it comes down to experience, reflecting, examining your patients, learning from every patient and slightly modifying your technique each time. Um, but it's, it's not easy. Yeah, Luigi, anything to add? Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Beautiful talk. And in this period is for you, I think it's so difficult that really, really, congratulations. Uh, the problem is, I agree with everything you say, is always the fourth, the fourth degree of Sunderland. For me, Sunderland classification is useful to understand but it's not useful at all because you know about the classification only after 10 months. So at the end of the, of the period. So what we need is to understand fourth degree in a reasonable time, up to three months. And we have to do that with TNL sign, uh, pseudomotor uh, um, that comes before others during the regeneration and ultrasound. These are, I think, the keys to understand the fourth degree that is the only one we have to address immediately and cut and do our craft. And I think we, we, we say all the same things. So you've anticipated my next question, which is before exploration or even after repair, how much store can you set on a tunnel sign? Uh, Dominique, other have to re reply. I'm, I'm not a, a panelist. I'm, I'm just with you. Andrew, what do you do? Uh, I don't give much attention to the tinnel sign because tinnel sign shows us that there is something goes on and that can be only one axon goes on and that can be a hundred of axons goes on. Um, I'm, I like to perform sonography. Uh, if uh, I see the uh, damage or partial damage of the nerve, I would like to go to exploration and uh, see it by uh, ourselves with uh, loop magnifications. And uh, sometimes uh, our sonographers say that it can be uh, injury of the nerve and uh, I go to explore the nerve and I find the, uh, just the fibrotic tissue that goes around the nerve and uh, give this shadow uh, during the sonography. But uh, for, for me, I think it's better than uh, leave it and think. Maybe it's just a fibrotic tissue or maybe it's a partial nerve injury. Uh, about tinnel sign, I, don't, I, I, I use it to more to for the patient maybe, <laughs> to show the patient that something is going on and something like that. But uh, I, 
think that's not really reliable uh, sign uh, of uh, regeneration. It shows that something is going on, but uh, well, we seem to have a lot of agreement. Is anybody willing to disagree on that? Or yeah, go on, Dom. Okay. Um, uh, you can't quantify recovery with a tunnel, but you can't quantify recovery with an ultrasound, and you can't quantify recovery mm. with uh, EMGs. And you can't actually quantify recovery if you biopsy the proximal stump and count the axons. There are so many factors that interplay. I agree with Andrew. We're looking for something to bring the patient on board and keep them on the journey. Um, I use Tunnel all the time. Um, now, the problem is if it's a patient who's ventilated or asleep with a closed injury, you can't examine all of the nerves and you can't do a Tunnel. Um, and sometimes because of other associated injuries and wounds and fractures, you can't really do a Tunnel in that acute setting. But in a closed injury, I find it really useful in dictating whether I go in early or not. And it's about clinical decision making. If there are positive predictive factors, incomplete nerve injuries, not too much neuropathic pain, reasonable soft tissue envelope, flexible compartments, then I may wait and monitor. And if I see that tunnel moving, um, and I believe in a continuity lesion, you will get regeneration with a low grade axonopathy at two to three millimeters per day and a higher grade axonopathy at much less one millimeter or static. And I've seen that in hundreds of patients now. So one millimeter a day is the minimum you would get if it's a regenerating nerve lesion, such as after a repair. So I use it all the time. If I see that regeneration, and you have to be very accurate in where you measure it, so you need a tape measure in your pocket, and you need to measure the tunnel from a bony landmark and repeat it from the same bony landmark, then a recovering lesion I'll watch. Um, but if it's a static tunnel, I'll go in and do an operation. But I don't think the tunnel can tell me whether the recovery is going to be good or bad. But if the rate of the tunnel's progression is more than one millimeter per day, it's likely the recovery is going to be good because it's likely to be a lower grade axonopathy. Colonel Brown, hope I've got your rank right or I'll be up on report. Makes me sound really old, that's the problem. Um, yeah, I mean, basically everything that Don's just said is pretty much what I just said. Um, it, so I think it's useful for several things. Um, whenever we're gathering information about nerve injuries, it's not just, there's not just going to be one piece of information, which is the be all and end all. And that's where I think the tunnels is really useful because the absence of it means it's very unlikely and not completely impossible, but it is very unlikely you've got any form of a degenerative nerve lesion. In the presence of a tunnels, and especially as Don was saying in the case of an advancing tunnels, that gives you time. Difficult, obviously, because particularly in these complex injuries and these multi-level injuries. Um, but going back to what Don was saying about the closed injury, you know, again, from what we've reported on previously, 20% of those nerve injuries were closed. And you're not in a, in, in a setting of a closed injury with no associated soft tissue defects or bony defects that need a, some kind of a procedure, especially in these patients which have got multiple other injuries, you don't want to do an operation for the sake of an operation. So I think it is useful as part of your overall information gathering purpose, but I completely agree, it's not going to give you all of your information. So, uh, Jason, welcome. Um, uh, we're, Andre's given us a, a presentation and we're in, uh, we're, we're discussing some of the issues uh, raised. Um, so um, in the presence of a, a nerve lesion in continuity, I'll go to Inga this time. Um, do you think that neurolysis has a value? Well, absolutely. I think um, this is actually uh, one of those cases um, where um, for one thing we can you know help um, decompress uh, the nerve of course um, and uh, create um, a healthy surrounding for um, the uh, you know neuropraxia part of the injury but then of course uh, for the neuroma and continuity this is uh, the scenario where we, we would actually do also an intraneural uh, uh, neurolysis 
and try and uh, separate fascicles and then uh, measure them uh, separately intraoperative to find out which ones are healthy, which ones are not. And then, you know, just do a specific reconstruction of uh, those that are, that are damaged and uh, that way saving um, those healthy ones that, um, you know, will recover uh, on their own or maybe already have recovered. It, at what point in terms of exposing and dissecting a nerve, do you risk more scarring or more vascular damage? How do you judge? Well, I think how, it's um, how much is too much. Um, well, you never know um, uh, until it's done, right? Um, I think uh, that is, that uh, for itself in itself is true. But I think um, if you decide um, after those three months uh, that you're in, you know the um, 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 not sufficiently recover an excellent, excellent Mises group, right? But then I think um, um, this is uh, the time to actually go in and um, this would also be uh, the time for me to go and do an intraneural neuralysis. Is, is that what you're asking for? Yes. Yeah. And, but ha, ha, what length can you safely expose a nerve over and how much dissection can you do before you do damage? Hard to tell, right? Um, I, I, I couldn't give you a number. Um, I think typically if we talk about in neuromas and continuity, um, there is um, there tends to be a specific area that we explore. Um, I've, I've never explored a, you know, a nerve in its entirety, for example, say um, in the complete forearm. I don't think this would be the classical definition of a neuroma and continuity. But of course, uh, there might be several sites, especially um, uh, in these type of injuries. Um, but with um, a neurolysis, you might expose the nerve. So in a scarred bed, you might expose the nerve over quite a long length. Well, it, it depends on the zone of injury, right? Um, I would, um, I think uh, it's always uh, wise uh, to uh, kind of come from a healthy uh, tissue side. Um, and of course, that can be tricky if, if you have a huge defect. Um, Andrew, you probably know uh, a lot about that. Um, but I think uh, this is probably um, um, from a surgical perspective, uh, the uh, technically speaking, most feasible way to do it, you know, uh, come from uh, the healthy sides and then uh, go go in because uh, this will also make uh, intraneural neurolysis a lot safer uh, because otherwise you'll just be digging through scar uh, and oftentimes we'll have a hard time identifying uh, fascicles properly. J Jason, uh, any thoughts on... Uh, neurolysis and um, for a, a, a neuroma or well a, a nerve in continuity that isn't working yeah again apologies I was late um, for I I have used it I think my my question is always the intraneural versus just just doing the neurolysis surrounding it to take off any scar tissue or or, or compression points um, you know, our, our experience has been to stay away from intraneural just because of the concern for additional damage. But, uh, I think, I think especially in the patient who hasn't had a recovery, um, or doesn't appear to be recovering, that there's an opportunity there, assuming the patient understands that the neurolysis in and of itself may not be sufficient. Um, I think it's, it's a relatively low risk operation. Dom and Kay, anything to add? Um, yeah, so again, you know, this, I think it, it is, it's got a real value. Um, patients who present or who develop post-operative, you know, specifically with neuropathic pain. Um, and again, we've seen out of the 36, 36 patients who needed mm -hmm. to have a neurolysis secondarily down the line, um, uh, 11 of those were, were nerves that had been previously repaired, 19 hadn't had a previous nerve procedure, but all of them had significant post-operative um, improvement of their neuropathic pain. So I think it, it, it definitely has value. Thank you. Tom, are you on the yeah, same table? Yeah, usually the indication is pain, isn't it? You know, the patient's got pain, pain on passive stretch, tunnel sign, um, and usually the pain's pretty, pretty severe and unrelenting. And so I think it's often a very easy decision to do a neurolysis. What's not easy is how to leave the nerve at the end of the operation. I rarely do an intraneural neurolysis unless there's been sort of a fragment or shrapnel into the nerve that needs removing. 
most of the time it's um, restoring the external nerve glide. I don't think with a knife I can change that intraneural milieu particularly unless there's a really constricted epineurium. So it'd be a rare situation where I might do an epineurotomy. Um, but but what you need... Would you do that under a microscope? Yeah, but it's it's rare. I can a handful of cases in 10 years. Um, most of the time I'm, I'm, I'm decompressing compression points releasing scar but the challenge you've then got is what do you do at the end do you resurface so uh, is, it, is it at a stage where you need to put an autologous flap over it local flaps do you need to um uh, you know do some other intervention because of that environment and uh, because because all nerves will rescar. so the important thing is getting the patient in a position where the pain is managed and you can instigate that rehabilitation get physiological glide back um, and so I use a lot of indwelling nerve catheters as well for two or three days after surgery and then passive mobilization exercises. Um, but again, we're in the gray area here, aren't we? Um, for me, it's an easy decision. Severe neuropathic pain after a nerve injury with points, a potential tether. But what you do and how extensive it's subjective, it's based on what you see and how much the nerve is moving after you've done your releases. But often, as Inga says, you need to come outside that zone of injury. Yeah, Luigi, you have a question, I think. Uh, they reply to my question. So uh, what I studied is that uh, neurolysis is very useful in ballistic injury for pain. So this is very, very useful. And uh, what I would like to ask to you, do you like uh, uh, barrier agent? Uh, do you finish a neurolysis and you put some... Uh, something around the nerve or do you believe in that? I personally do that in normal neurolysis. I'm not talking about ballistic injury. Just to say to the patient, uh, I've done everything I can. The first time you didn't do that, the second time. And all we know that uh, probably it doesn't work, but I would like to ask your opinion. Pick someone. Jason, I'll pick you. Yeah, sure. I, I, so I, I, I do depending on the bed. So if, if it's if it's uh, surrounded by muscle, then I typically do. And if it's if it's a shell of scar tissue that I've peeled the nerve off of, I don't. Um, and that's just absolutely non evidence based, but but practice uh, practice uh, practice choice. And I think because the less I can irritate uh existing scar tissue the better and and i think the muscle tends to scar down to the nerve a little bit more and cause more problems but i have no evidence to back that up so uh I'll caveat that andre i see that you use um fat graft prior to a repair would you use it if you did a neurolysis yeah um uh, almost always, if we have very uh, scared uh, nerve, uh, if we have uh, have a nerve in uh, very scarred around uh, tissues, um, I, I will use the neuralizer. Uh, I will use the lipofilling. We take uh, just subcutaneous fat from the abdominal area, mix it with uh, bone marrow aspirate and uh, put it around the nerve. Uh, the bone marrow uh, is a great uh, coagulator. It can uh, coagulate itself. So it uh, turns something like a gel around the nerve or fat gel around the nerve. Uh, we have a few uh, patients, about three or four of uh, patients, uh, when we uh, make the nerve re-exploration after the uh, uh, lipofilling, uh, mostly to take off some metal works, uh, uh, some plates and other things. And uh, we found that uh, there is uh, around the nerve that's forming some types of uh, fat scar tissue that uh, are uh, like puffy <laughs> enough. Uh, that's not, 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 not a, a scar. 
uh, that can compress the nerve. Is, is it a gliding tissue? Uh, yeah, a little, a little. <laughs> not not like a normal uh, uh, fat, but uh, it's uh, for 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 my concern, it's better than the scar itself. So it's scar with a fat. <laughs> it's not just a scar. So. Inga, anything to add? Um, well, uh, maybe just a slight um, alteration of, uh, of that. Uh, what I would typically um, do, you know, for example, for these neuropathic pains of the superficial branch of uh, the radial nerve, uh, which we see somewhat frequently, um, I sometimes use nano fat. So not, um, not just a fat grafting in itself, so not micro fat, um, but nano fat. Um, and the hypothesis, um, and we know that it would be that we have all those, you know, stem cells and all the regenerative potential in the nano fat. Um, but um, this, uh, you know, this way I would not be adding any, you know, extra volume to a potentially already tight area. Well, I think that can you explain to a simple orthopedic surgeon what nano fat is? Well, it's, 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 it's essentially just um, um, a step further preparation wise. So, um, you know, when you harvest the fat uh, and you, you wash it, you do those scars rolling techniques. And then what you have um, is micro fat, right? This is, would be just your fat grafting. And for the nano fat, what you do is you actually destroy uh, the fat cells. So you have certain filter systems uh, and you pass yeah, your harvested fat through them. Um, and you know how it's commonly done, you go 30 times through one filter and then 30 times through the next filter and then one last filtration process. Um, and this way the fat gets emulsified um, and it's a lot more liquidy. Um, and in theory, and you know, there's uh, some uh, good evidence for that. You know, the stem cells that we know that are in the fat are somewhat freed, um, and uh, you can uh, use uh, those for all kinds of regenerative purposes. Um, so I think um, that sometimes might be a nice add-on, but um, of course, also like it doesn't cure neuropathic pain. Otherwise, we'd all be using it. Kate. Uh... And Dom, Kate, you probably don't have, your patients don't have a lot of abdominal fat, I suspect. We were just saying maybe we should take up a career in sort of liposculpting now, because I think that probably would actually be quite beneficial. I, I mean, I love this idea. I think I, I don't have any experience in in using either lipofill or nanofat. Um, it sounds really interesting. I think anything that's worth trying is, is worth it. Um, one of the questions I was actually going to ask some of the other panellists is, We've talked about, you know, obviously making sure there's a really good wound bed, making sure that you've got a good surrounding uh, vascular structure um, and potential use of uh, conduits, especially if you've had to open up the epineurin because that's been really scarred. Um, but do anybody else even just use something simple like just um, using a bit of tissue around the nerve, you know, in the knowledge that it's not going to be there forever, but it might stop any scarring in the interim? That, that's typically my go-to. Um, I, I like the tissue because I think it just it disappears relatively quickly and, and particularly for volume uh, concerns where you don't really want to have a large, um, whether it's fat, I, I don't have a, I don't have any experience with fat, but certainly some of the um, on the market covers that you can use for nerve, nerve gliding purposes, I, I find they're very space occupying. So for that, I think the tissue is good because it's temporary and then, and then gone hopefully by the time scars formed. Uh, and cheaper than conduit, presumably. In, in our facility, it is. Um, I, I don't know if that's a ubiquitous thing. Dom? Um, yeah, I, I too am interested in fat grafting. I've, I've seen Andrew talk about it before. One of my concerns I've had is, is how you contain the fat um, and whether if you've done an extensive neurolysis, you know, you get an oozy wet wound. And But talking to people, that doesn't seem to be the experience. Um, and the timing and whether you repeat the fat grafting, you know, is it something you just do once or, or do you repeat? So one of my colleagues does repeated fat um, infiltration around nerves that are scarred rather than neurolysis. Um, and probably there's some stem cell function there in modifying the, um, the environment. So I, I, I don't have a lot of experience in it. I've got colleagues who've used it. I've got a few reservations, but I'd like to learn more about it. In terms of wraps and adjuncts into seal, um, when I used to seal 
for a nerve repair or a graft, I liberally sort of squirt around the, the environment because uh, it makes me feel better. But I wouldn't open a seal in a patient who's got a continuity nerve injury where I've done a neurolysis. Um, I've used a fair number of proprietary wraps um, and I prefer coll collagen type biologic wraps um, in the past. And, and this is this really polarizes nerve surgeons. Some surgeons believe that putting anything constricting around the nerve is dangerous. And other people say, well, it's 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 providing some sort of barrier to scar and maybe revascularizing and introducing a new paraneurium around the nerve. Um, I'll just tell you my experience. I've done about 180 wraps now. Um, some patients will have two in series and occasionally three. It's very expensive. Um, I've had to re-explore three. Uh, one was because of a hematoma that developed in a patient on warfarin. And I had to go back in about 10 days with neuropathic pain and found the nerve was strangulated, even though I'd put it in loosely and there was hematoma inside the wrap. And the nerve was about one and a half times the diameter I left it. So nerves do swell after neurolysis. That's the message. And the other two were planned expirations where there were tendon reconstructions and I'd wrap the nerve prophylactically. And I found that there was a junctional scar. So the wrap there of nerve looked quite healthy, but the bit that wasn't wrapped, which is still in your wound, there's a little bit of tether at that point. So I think they probably do something, but it comes back to that relative judgment. If the bed is relatively avascular, it's a big scarred bed. There's been contamination, there's been fragmentation and shrapnel. There's been an unstable wound and infection in the past then I wouldn't use it. <laughs> so, so this is the gray area of surgery. If it was an elective revision surgery for someone with complex pain, you know, they've had a plate put on the medial epicondyle and the nerve was caught up in scar. Then I think it's a nice cushioning barrier <laughs> between the nerve and the plate and I'd put it in there. So um, it's very much a gray area for me. Um, I don't think I'm doing any harm. Uh, whether I'm doing any benefit, I don't know. But I'm pro well, I'm probably harming the financial position of our our hospital because the they tend to be quite expensive. So we need we need good studies, but you can't control the injury. That's the problem. Jason, there there was a question uh, before you're able to log in around uh, where a nerve is disrupted. Um, what's your best guide as as to how far back? to cut so with ballistic injuries we'd agreed that the first three weeks is a bad time to judge sometimes somewhere between three weeks and three months is probably optimal uh, but uh, and then there's a compromise between uh, making the nerve gap bigger and, and and trying to put two dead nerves together what's the yeah if only we can solve this question um so I think the, we're looking at two things in our institution to see if we can get some guidance on this because I'm actually not a, I'm not a believer in that delay makes a difference. Um, and so one of the things we're doing is we're doing some high, high definition ultrasounds on day zero, day one and day two, and then bring patients back at two weeks and six weeks to see if there's any change in neurovascular flow and um, because I, I have, we have, and again, anecdotally had some significant success with early excision back to bleeding healthy fascicle intra-op, making the gap bigger, and then either doing, you know, let's say transposition to detention and doing a direct repair or something similar. So um, currently, uh, I it's almost a gestalt more than anything else to cut back to healthy tissue, what looks like healthy tissue, i.e. there's nice healthy fascicle and bleeding fascicle and make a bigger gap. I, I think that ultimately, if you're gonna do a delayed technique is better. Um, how, how else can you do it? I mean, I'm hoping that this ultrasound study will help us because I think that's something we've really struggled with and we'll follow patients who appear to have what looks like normal, normal you know, nerve, especially in on exploration, if you're fixing fixing a fracture at the same time, you look at the nerve, it's in continuity, it doesn't look particularly bad, but at the six week, three month, six month mark, nothing's working. Um, and you can have the same two patients come in with the same injury and, and one person's nerve is fine, one person's you know, nerve recovers and the third person doesn't. 
Um, so we're hoping that ultrasound is going to be the guide to that and just show us where that, where that zone of damage is. And then does it actually expand the way we've been historically taught? And I have to say, I'm, our early, our early hypothesis and our early data would suggest that there probably isn't this large expansion of the zone of injury. At least in Is our, that including um, high velocity injuries? Yeah, yeah, great question. So, uh, so I'm not a huge fan of high velocity as a term. We typically use high energy versus low energy for many reasons. Um, again, I see handguns that have taken whole hands off. And I've seen AR-15s and other assault rifles that have really small areas of damage. So um, in the high energy uh, ballistics that we see in our center, um, certainly I, I, I think the zone is probably substantially larger. In the lower energy injuries, uh, I, I think that the neuropraxic injury that they obtain is a smaller zone that doesn't expand. Again, ho hopefully our data will will we'll be able to pull that out, but um, that's certainly how we're looking at it now. And, and for the high energy trauma, um, at least our preliminary data suggests if there is a zone of injury that expands, it is not substantial. Um, and so, you know, your, your cutback doesn't have to be this large, large cutback to the healthier tissue. Great. Well, uh, we're into our last five minutes. We, we uh, have sorry. 64. Sorry. Jonathan, yep. can, I just, can I just ask Andre a question? Because I think that's really yep. interesting. And thanks for that, Jason. Um, because I think there is a difference between when you're dealing with ballistic high energy trauma and with the light, even though it might be a gunshot wound, the slightly lower energy you know, uh, wound. So my question to Andre was, are you, have you... Uh, got a significant number of injuries that are from you know, more blast type injuries? Because again, for us, you know, we had so sixty-five percent of our of our nerve injuries were secondary to these high-energy blast-type explosions. Um, we have a, a lot of. Uh, uh, I show uh, in the slides that about uh, sixty-five percent of uh, injuries was from shrapnel or uh, blast injury. Um, and only Sorry, I had I had a pretty when you said the shrapnel, I I, want, I did wonder that, but I didn't I, I just wanted to double check that that's what you did mean. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so that's really interesting then, because basically the numbers then are pretty much identical, which yeah, that's interesting. Uh so, yeah, Jonathan. So I was just going to ask in the last few minutes whether there was anything else that the panelists wanted to pick out of the cases that you presented, Andre, or if you had any questions from the cases you presented for the panel. I have one question for Andre. I saw that he used mesenchymal cells to, for, for the bone marrow, for the muscle. I know that yeah. you are doing a PhD thesis on that. Yeah. So if you believe in that, please tell us how it works. Um, uh, in the literature, we find uh, that uh, the mesenchymal cells of uh, red bone marrow uh, can differentiate to uh, satellite cells of uh, uh, myocytes. Um, the CPT in Ukraine, we don't have the laboratories that can uh, uh, make such uh, uh, make such uh, um, experiment, but uh, we perform more on uh, some kind of uh, um, histological data, uh, biochemistry data, and uh, some EMG studies, uh, MRI, CT study. Uh, so uh, we find that uh, uh, in the groups where we inject the uh, bone marrow aspirate into the target muscles, after we cut the nerve and then try to see it uh, and we try to see it badly, 
because uh, I want uh, to have bad regeneration of the nerve to understand how my uh, how BMAC uh, would work on muscle. Uh, and we find that uh, by MRI, we have uh, uh, less swellings of the muscle. Uh, as you know, uh, the acute stage of the narration in MRI shows like uh, the great uh, swelling of the muscle. Uh, and the EMG studies, we find that uh, a little more um, motor unit potentials we can find in the uh, groups uh, of animals when in which we use the BMAC and uh, uh, by uh, histological, uh, by histology, we find that uh, the uh, um, ma ma muscle uh, is uh, more likely to preserve and uh, not to uh, uh, hypertrophy so fast. Uh, if we use the BMAC uh, injection uh, after the surgery. So uh, we think that, uh, again, by using the literature data about that, it can uh, uh, differentiate to um, <laughs> satellite cells of my seeds sites. Uh, we think that the injection of BMAC into the skeletal muscles uh, can uh, prolong the time of the muscle before its atrophy. Protect, protect the muscle. Yeah. Protect the muscle from its uh, atrophy during the narration. But again, as Ankur uh, said that the previous webinar, it's uh, when we deal with uh, uh, acute injuries, with civilian injury of the nerve, it's okay. But when we deal with uh, the blast injury, uh, when there is a lot of uh, tissue damage <laughs> uh, to the muscle and a lot of uh, BMAC itself goes to the muscle because we have the fracture, uh, it is uh, very uh, difficult to understand would it lead to formation of, for example, um, ossificates in muscles, or will it uh, help the muscle to, uh, or, or will it protect the muscle from a hypotrophy? So it's... Great, well, we're out of time. Um, we still have uh, 60 hardy souls um, uh, logged in. Um, but uh, thank you to all the panelists. Andre, a remarkable uh, talk uh, in terms of collecting all the data in face of, of, the, of your uh, workload and the fact that you're being bombed every day. So uh, well, well done, uh, gr a great uh, presentation. Uh, thank you to all the panelists for coming. Uh, we are planning at least one more webinar before Christmas, um, and the topic of the next webinar will be managing neuromas. Um, we'll confirm the date and the exact panel um, in the next few days. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone. Uh, and uh, as is customary, Andre, do you want to close the meeting in Ukrainian? Yes. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, all of you that you join uh, this discussion. Uh, that's the, it was very helpful for us. Uh, I understand that we need to uh, add something more about uh, some clinical aspects of the narration and some other things, but I try to prefer this uh, presentation uh, uh, that not not to talk much about some basics, uh, but to go for um, uh, the algorithm itself. So I understand what what I need to upgrade, uh, what we need to upgrade in the, this algorithm, and uh, what we need to do uh, more. But uh, as I understand that uh, in totally, it's it can be applied into clinical practice. Uh, yes.
And the Ukrainian closure? And the Ukrainian closure. <laughs> Дякую, шановні колеги, що були з нами. А наш поки що в нас до Різдва планується ще один вебінар. Він буде по лікуванню болючих невром а, після ампутації кінцівок. І а, лектор П'єр Луїджі Тос, він, а, у нього є великий досвід лікування а, невром. Також, можливо, буде ще один а, лектор, ми подивимося. А, про більш точно поки що орієнтовно це буде в грудні, але більш точну дату та, а, власне, лекторів я а, скажу пізніше. А, дякую всім, що приєдналися, дякую за ваші запитання і до зустрічі наступного разу. So, thanks all. Uh, thanks to everyone. Please stay stay strong and stay, stay safe. See you next time. Thank you. See you next time. Jason, I will send you uh, the recordings of uh, this lecture by email, okay? Thank yeah, you. thanks so much. I was sorry I was late. I was stuck in the OR and then I couldn't get the link to work. So I, uh, I, I, really I, I, under, I understand. So uh, thank you that you can join us uh, to the discussion. I will send you the uh, lecture. Thank you. Perfect. I appreciate it. Take care. Yeah. Andre, I just want to say thank you so much. It's been really great um, doing another discussion group with you. Um, I'm interested to know if that girl does get in touch with you. So do email me if she does. I think that would be interesting to know. And okay. uh, you know, really keen to keep the keep the, um, the the dialogue going between us. So that'd be great. Okay. Thank you, Kate. Hi. Uh, so, I just want to take the time just very shortly. Yes. Uh, Maritsu says hi. Um, uh, I know you want to have him with you. Um, and if there's anything we can uh, do to help uh, from uh, Zurich side, always feel free to let us know, either uh, Maritsu or I. Um, and uh, thank you so much for this great presentation and. Thank you, Inga. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Bye. Тож, дякую, шановні колеги. Тут кілька запитань. Не знаю, чи ще лишилися з нами люди, які їх запитували. Is there a role of uh, nerve transfer in this kind of injury? Yes, uh, I uh, said about it. If uh, there is no possibility to uh, make some reconstruction, nerve reconstruction in the period from three weeks to three months, it is better to make uh, nerve transfers early and uh, then uh, I, I even showed the case when uh, we perform nerve transfer, AAN to a motor ulnar nerve, and uh, uh, the, the soldier returned to his duty uh, without the reconstruction of ulnar nerve at the level of the elbow. So, uh, yes. Tosh. Дякую всім і, до речі, нагадую всім, що в нас в цю суботу о 6 вечора вебінар по терапії кісті. Так що ще зустрінемось.